Hello and welcome to Montgomery County Community College. This is John Ricciuti and my guest today is screenwriter Johnny Giordano. He is the author of a screenplay titled Tiger Lil. Johnny, welcome. To John, you. thank you for having me. Welcome to Montgomery County Community College. I'm um, happy to be here. I guess the first thing I, I should ask you before we get into that is a little bit about yourself. What, what is your history in the Philadelphia area? Well, Philly, I feel, is a part of my culture, part of who I am, uh, based on both parents being from South Philly. We're South Philly Italian-Americans. And uh, as I'm sure you know, John, that's a very, um, it's a very specific type of, of culture. And that is one that has been carried through my childhood and into my adulthood. And I've been in and out of South Philly my entire life, both grandparents still living in South Philly. Well, they passed now, but... Um, I grew up in South Jersey, though, as a lot of South Philians end up in South Jersey. So that's, that's where I went to high school. That's where I became an adult. My mother, every Sunday, still cooks gravy, meatballs, sausage, and uh, fragile. Being with family, my uncle, Tommy, and uh, he, was, he is the brother of my father, John Jordana, who passed away uh, many years ago. Uh, God rest his soul. We, uh, we would always get together and have family dinners on Sundays. And it's always in and out of Philly because being from South Jersey, you're one hop, skip, and jump over the bridge to South Philly. So it's visiting relatives, coming back out, having dinner. And that has been instilled in me. and It's something I'm grateful for. In looking at your bio, besides a screenwriter, you were also an actor. What, what was your discovery into, into acting? Acting was something that I never thought about, say, in high school. Uh, I always had a love, a great love for film, and I was intrigued. And the actors in specific films, like a lot of Scorsese films, uh, one of which Robert De Niro is, you know, one of my influences to this day. Um, but I didn't know what I wanted to do or be a part of until after high school. And that's when I discovered acting. I tried my hand in it and I, I went to South Philly of all places and studied with a, a lady by the name of Mary Ann Claro. She had her own talent agency and acting school. So interesting enough, went back to my roots to learn acting and the South Philly teachers there were telling me that I had a feel for it and that just to get that positive feedback was enough. I was hooked. So I continued on from there. How was Robert De Niro an influence to you? At age nine, I was watching uh, Goodfellas. I was watching Cape Fear. I was watching Taxi Driver. This is because of my parents. They were, especially my father. He was very much a De Niro fan and a uh, fan of his films. And I, I was, you know, so you know, I was shown these films at very young age. I was probably sneaking around the couch to watch these films, but they just they drew me in. Uh, I think the Italian American culture was something that was a natural fit obviously. And uh, after my father had passed, I, I feel like when I would watch De Niro, there was in some way, it just, it, it reminded me of a father figure. And I, I think that that's, you know, generally speaking, I'm thinking subconsciously, that's, I think, why I had such an attachment to him uh, as a fan of his work. What is your favorite De Niro movie, then? Goodfellas. Not only my favorite De Niro movie, but my favorite movie of all time. It's, it's a perfect piece of cinema, in my opinion, from the, the way it was shot to the way it was written to the storyline to the character, the actors involved. You, you went to Hollywood? You worked in Hollywood? Did you go to anywhere, travel around, do anything with, with your acting pursuit? So from Philly, I, I worked at a di at, in a dinner theater show called Joey and Maria's Wedding. And I, I worked from Tony Rigatoni. Which, who was just a character that would interact with the people experiencing this dinner theater, this wedding that they were at, this fake wedding. And we would just learn how to improv with, with random people sitting down having dinner and we would interact with them in character. And that taught me a very good principle of acting is to think on your feet and improv and, and speak as if you are the character. So once I became a little better at that, they gave me the role of Joey. And, uh, that was fun. I actually had dialogue and I was up in front of, you know, a crowd of at least 50 to 60 to 70 people uh, in the Philadelphia area and we would, we would do shows and we would tour. 
the lady who played Maria in Joey Maria's Wedding was moving across country to Los Angeles to, be, to pursue acting. She asked me if I wanted to drive across country with her. And I was, at the time I was 20 years old, 21, in college. And I said, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going with you. And I jumped in the car and we drove across country. And uh, I had a buddy out there. Luckily, he gave me a, a couch to sleep on. And I stayed with him. And 10 days led to two months. Two months led to seven years. I was out there. Did you do any acting out there? Yes, I did. I, I, I dove right in. I had the typical acting lifestyle. I was a server by, by night and studied acting and tried to audition as much as possible by day. Um, and I, I worked. I booked a few roles. Could you name a few? Yeah. Um, the one role I think is, is worthy of talking about it was a stage role. It was a, uh, a published stage play by the name of Over the River and Through the Woods. Joe DiPietro, the published author, wrote that one. And that was a, that was a good wholesome family style comedy, but it had a drama, dramatic aspect to it. And I played a character, Nicholas Cristano, and he lived with both sets of grandparents in North Jersey. His parents had moved to Florida to retire, but he stayed in North Jersey. And he lived with one set of grandparents, the other set would come over and they would all have family dinner. And the comedy just was a riot from there. He landed a position in marketing uh, that brought him across the country to Washington State. And the struggle was him moving across country away from his grandparents. And unbeknownst to the character, his one grandfather was diagnosed with cancer. So that's where the heartfelt uh, storyline came in. And... Um, when the audience reacted to my performance on stage, that's when I, I knew that there was something really special about this thing, acting. And it, it, was, um, it was profound, the, uh, the connection that the, uh, as an actor we would have with the audience, like affecting them affected us. And it was like an emotional cycle, give, uh, give and take back and forth from the, the audience to the stage. And I just had such a, a new profound respect for the craft itself. And then from there, I studied at Lee Strasberg Institute West, which Lee Strasberg, he was the teacher of many great famous actors, like one of which is Al Pacino. Lee Strasberg himself was a, uh, a very famous actor. Uh, he was in Godfather too. From there, I went on to, to book independent film work. And that's an education in itself because some productions are high budget, others are very low budget. And the low budget ones, you, you learn the most because it's run and gun. You're not only acting, but you're carrying equipment. You're helping lighting setups. You're coming together as a team to try to figure out how we're gonna get this thing done. Oh, our, our, our location just uh, bailed on us. We need to find a new location. So let's go, let's just get in the car and go find a place where we can shoot this scene. Oh, that looks good. Let's jump out and let's shoot it here. <laughs> so that, that kind of experience was, was very uh, rewarding. In a lot of ways. You played a, in an you speak, speaking about independent films. You, you played a, a World War II soldier who lost his brother to the Japanese, and, and in it you said it was a profound experience for you because you had to dig deep into your prejudices. Well, not that I have any um, prejudices in myself, but I, the imagination work was was uh, it, it was a, a large undertaking. That, okay, so the role was uh, Private Benjamin in a short film called The Bridge. And The Bridge was a World War II film. And I played a character, Private Benjamin. His brother was killed by the Japanese. So lo and behold, our, our crew on the field, we stumble upon a Japanese, so what we think is a Japanese soldier. It turns out that soldier is an American, he's a Japanese American soldier, and he's on our side. He joins our squad. And now I have a Japanese American soldier on my squad while I'm still suffering very deeply about the death of my brother. So throughout, throughout the course of the film, it's, it's me trying, struggling with not wanting to, to kill this character, just based out of inner rage that I feel towards the Japanese as the character. Um, and then it's a really a touching ending in that film. They actually save each other's lives in, the, in battle. And the Japanese-American soldier gets shot and dies in my arms. And 
I break down. So as an actor, that was the most, the largest undertaking I've ever could think about doing. And I was actually, uh, I was actually regarded as one of the best parts of that film, which was so humbling. And, and uh, I really wish that it, it, it won two merit awards, that short, The Bridge, and it won a festival award for best short. So uh, it, it, it's interesting that as actors, we work from one job to the next. So that as high as I was flying of just being able to, to do that role and, and, to, and to see the reaction people had from it. When it's done, it's, it's over. When it's over, it's what's next. And as a struggling actor in Los Angeles, you are a dime a dozen. So you might not work again for who knows how long. So that thing that's feeding your soul is acting, the reactions that people have. And it, you're always searching for it. And when it's not there, and when it doesn't come, it's really hard to not fall into, you know, stages of depression, actor depression. Did you? At times, absolutely, yeah. I think it's still a struggle. I mean, actors who stick it out and continue to, to do it, they are a special breed, I think. It's, it's somebody who is willing to, uh, to put everything else aside, conventional, um, to, to go after what, you know, feeds their soul and what, what their passion is. You, you mentioned De Niro, and a lot of people think that the best movie he ever made was Raging Bull. And of course, there's a, an attraction that you have to Raging Bull because there was a sequel to be made about that. Mm -hmm. And you had an opportunity to play the, a young Robert De Niro in Raging Bull. In Los Angeles in 2011, they were casting for the prequel sequel to Raging Bull. Now, I'm a huge fan of Raging Bull. I'm a huge fan of De Niro's performance in Raging Bull. He won an Oscar for Raging Bull. Scorsese should have won an Oscar as the best director for Raging Bull. He did. Um, so that the fan part of me of that film looked up at looked at cast look at the casting uh, list and saw that they were making a sequel to that movie and said the fan of that film said they can't make a sequel to Raging Bull that's a piece of classic art that would never work the actor in me said all I want to do is act in this film this is everything for me because De Niro's performance as Jake LaMotta was one of the main influences that you know directed me to try this thing called acting. I mean, it was, it, it's, it's amazing. He gained 50 pounds, I think, for that role. Um, so I, I auditioned, I found a way to audition for it. And it was the young Jake LaMotta. That's what I went in for. And I, I you know, I put my heart on, out there and I got called back. Mm -hmm. That was an exciting event. When I, when I was called back for that role, I was, I was thrilled. It felt like it was coming full circle. It felt like things were, like it was my destiny to, to, to act in this movie, considering he's such a big influence on me. So I went back for the, the callback, and it turns out they called me back for a different role. The young Jake LaMotta in this prequel sequel uh, had to look like a young William Forsyth, because in this new movie, Jake LaMotta, as an older Jake LaMotta, is William Forsyth, who is a really good, B plus actor, I would say. Um, so when I, I was like, fine, I just want to be a part of it. So the role that I was in for, called back for, was Jake LaMotta as a young fighter, as a street fighter. He had street brawls in, I think it was the Bronx or Brooklyn, wherever he was from. So he had street brawls and his best friend would set up his fights. He was the guy that was collecting money and, and he was just like his, man, his street manager and best buddy. That character is what they called me back for, which I was like, great. I'm not going to be young Jake LaMotta, but my heart's not completely broken. I would love to play his, his young manager on the streets taking money. And, you know, that, that is fitting for me. I love it. I dove right into it. I got my acting coach to come help me with it. I, I bought a fedora from the costume store. I, I did everything that I could to prepare for that. I went in, I auditioned, and I knocked it out of the park. They... It wasn't one of the many auditions where you go in and you audition and you and you don't do so well and you and you, you kick yourself to your car the entire time. Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? 
the worst feeling in the world, right? Coming out of that, it was the best feeling out of the world. It felt like I hit a home run. The people, the director of the movie was in the, in the room and he went, wow, that's how it's done. That's not easy. He started saying to everybody, I, I was like, I have it. This is it. And it seemed like destiny. I got home. I celebrated. One week later, no call. One week led to two weeks. And now if you're not getting a call, if they're not at least contacting you by two weeks, you know that something's up. But I still didn't let go. I was like, this is mine. I, I can't. This is I, I, I felt with plenty of rejection before, but this one was mine. Three weeks went by. I found a way to contact the casting director and I asked her what was going on. And she said, John, you did a great job. But the kid that we went with for, for young Jake LaMotta's best friend looks more like young Joe Montagna than you look like young Joe Montagna. Because the older version of that character is played by Joe Montagna. It was more important that he looked like a young version of Joe Montagna than any performance could have helped. So that was the reason. Why, and that just goes to show that even when you think you have full control in this business, you don't. And there are so many different elements and aspects to the casting process that it's completely out of your control. That, that was... Uh, that was a, a major heartbreak for me. That was very, very tough. That was a tough one. After that crushing disappointment, I, I came home. I, I, I got to spend more time with family. And I decided to go back to school. And I, I went to school for film. And I studied the behind the camera stuff. And I did that because I knew I had no control to put myself, to, to get, I had no control as an actor to get these roles. Let me go learn how to make my own projects. Maybe I could put myself in some roles that would at least feel as good as acting in those kind of things. Where did you go to school? I went to Pace University in, uh, in Manhattan. Yeah, in Manhattan. Okay. So now you've written a screenplay, and the screen the screenplay is about your aunt, Lillian Reese. Lillian Reese. Uh, so how was she your aunt? She's Jewish. You're Italian. Yes. <laughs> Lillian Reese was out of respect. My aunt, my mother grew up in the same South Philly neighborhood as Lillian and her, her daughters. So my mother and her one daughter, Barbara, were best friends uh, in the schoolyard. And they grew up together. She's my godmother to this day, Barbara. So Aunt, aunt Lil was out of respect. All of the grandkids, grandmother or aunt for me was aunt. And uh, she, was, she was quite a, a woman, John. She was quite a woman. What what is your play specifically about? So my one sentence for this screenplay is Tiger Lil is the true life story of Lillian Reese, a struggling single mother and burlesque dancer who found her true calling in a life of crime. And Lillian, she, she, she certainly did find a calling in a life of crime. She put together a crew of gangster one of which was her boyfriend and gangster pals. And she went and she, uh, she successfully pulled off the largest home burglary heist in America's history, the Pottsville heist. Your story is, the characters in it, are the, I, I get references like their names like Bobby Simone and Stanford and Nikki Scarfo and yourself is in there. Do you, do you have an alter ego in there? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I think all writers kind of write themselves into their, into their work. John, I, I mean, you have to. I mean, you gotta, you gotta pull from what you know inside. I've only been around 36 years, but I've, I've lived in three major cities. I've worked in three major cities. So, I mean, I, I know different types of people and I certainly know this life and this lifestyle. Um, my mother and my family has, have told me stories. I, not to mention as a child, I was directly influenced in hanging around these people and they were like family and are like family. Some of the people that you mentioned, um, as far as characters in the screenplay are a combination of actual figures and what I've read about them and, and articles and online and, uh, and and also my imagination. What was it like being in her company? She was larger than life. She would put on uh, rated R movies for me and her grandson, Roscoe, who to this day is my cousin out of respect. And actually he got the copyright done for me as he's a lawyer and he got this copyright done for me for the screenplay. And, I, he's, he loves that I'm writing the story of her story. 
But anyway, she would put rated R movies on uh, so me and Roscoe can watch and see nudity while she would go upstairs and, and uh, you know, roll tobacco cigarettes. Did, <laughs> did, uh, did, who would you have in mind to play her character? I love the idea of it becoming a big budget film, and I love the idea of uh, Jennifer Lawrence. Maybe uh, you know that would be amazing. She's she really does good, strong women work, and she would be a good candidate for that. I also love uh, Scarlett Johansson. She's a Hungarian Jew, so I feel like they don't have to necessarily look Italian. And and you want to try to get this too into the hands of a Hollywood producer. Absolutely. That would be a dream come true to have. Uh, and you know what? People say, uh, can a man write a, a female story? Well, I, I think it's just, it's incidental that I'm, I happen to be a man. If, if I was a, a woman in the family, it would have been a woman writing the story. I would love to see a, a female director get her hands on this and direct this piece. And I think as far as a lead actress role goes, this is, it's, it's got all the, the meat and the gravy. It's got everything an actress could ever want. The... Um she was like a uh, she was a, a, a mob mall. Is that it? Or she was like a made woman? <laughs> you have to be a uh, Sicilian to be made. I know that exactly. And right. you could never on any in any mob in any place in the world be female and be a made female. However, she provided enough for the mob that if that could happen, she would be a made member of the, of the crew. And that's kind of my take on this. Kind of my uh, my my niche here with this film. It's if there ever could be an unofficial mob, uh, mob member that was a female and not Italian, this is an example of someone who would have been. She provided more for that crew at that time than any other soldier. What I would like to ask you, when I, when I read through your, your screenplay, what was the most challenging thing about writing this, this screenplay? This was a first time attempt at writing a feature length screenplay for me. I've written a uh, I've written short films in the past, but this was my first feature screenplay. Um, I would say the story itself has been something that I wanted to tell for a long time and didn't have the tools. After I graduated from Pace, I, I had taken advanced screen study. So the largest challenge, I, I would imagine, for me, it was, it was doing the story justice in a way that kept it concise and... Uh, on the, on the correct form in the correct format and in the most professional uh, way that a screenwriter could could do it and there are very specific ways to, to write a screenplay as opposed to writing a novel so I wanted to to make sure that I uh, like I said do the, the story justice and as a 36 year old telling a story about the 50s I really had to dive in and do my research which I did I guess what I should have asked you first is what prompted you to write it Wow, just this story that I've been hearing my entire life. I've been hearing about this Wonder Woman, crime Wonder Woman, uh, since I'm a kid. And it's been like stories around the table. It's been stories, like instead of ghost stories, we, we were you know right, holding a flashlight and telling Mum Mum Lillian stories. And uh, she was something of a, she was something of a, uh, a movie character in the story reel of my head since I'm nine years old. For the sake of audience, what did she physically look like? Wow. She was described best, I think Robert Simone described her this way in his book, uh, as the face of Eva Gardner with the body of Sophia Loren. She was a, she was a classic starlet. She had starlet good looks. And you said Robert Simone, that was her lawyer. Yes. And he's the lawyer that actually won the case for her. Correct. Yes. And, and uh, it, it, yes, it is in his book. What, what did you find was most rewarding about doing this screenplay? Wow. Just finishing it, number one. It was a big undertaking. And uh, when I finished it, it was 160 pages. The, the average uh, length of, well, the industry standard for a screenplay is 120. So I had to whittle it down 40 pages. I had the help of my... Uncle Thomas Giordano, who is a published author, who also is from South Philly and knows this story as well. And he also knows the details of South Philly in that, during that time. So I went to his home and he and I edited down my 160 to 120 
and there were there were intricate details involved that I had missed hmm. that he'd helped me correct. So speaking, I definitely thank him for that. Well, speaking of Tommy Giordano, he knows a lot of stories. He's a story unto himself. Yes, he is. If you, you know. What did you want the audience to come away with from this? Well, the industry right now, John, is in a way where we're, we're really highlighting uh, women's strength. Not only is that the film industry, but that is the temperature of the country, as we all know. Uh, I think that the culture is a direct reflection from the film industry, and it has been since the beginning of film. In fact, from what I understand, Mussolini used film as propaganda to control his society after World War II. And um, I don't want to dive into that too deep. That's, that's another conversation in itself. But I feel like how relevant is a story of a struggling uh, female character who... In, in this screenplay, it's structured so she goes through all struggles, many of the women's struggles that exist today, very relevant. During this time in the 50s was a uh, civil rights movement. It was a lot of women's rights. It, was, it, 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 it almost parallels a lot of the things that happen, are happening today. And uh, you see all of those issues that we can relate to today within the screenplay, and it's all based on truth. So, How did Lillian get to be so powerful? Well, her, her looks and her, her attractiveness went further than skin deep. She could look through you, make you laugh, and keep you wanting more. So that she was able to get regular customers at the celebrity room, which is where she danced burlesque. So not only was she a knockout on stage, but she would have drinks with these men afterwards, and they would continue to come back and they would pay her um, envelopes of cash, they would, they would pay her rent. They gave her cars, jewelry. It was, it was ridiculous how much that she got from all of these coal moguls. One of the moguls gave her a tip about another coal mogul who was corrupt. He was, he was hoarding cash from the IRS. He was, he was avoiding, it was tax evasion. He had all of his cash in his safe in, her, in his basement. When she found out that little tip, she put together her crew and they went in and they robbed him blind. So she took down a corrupt top, and we all know these corrupt top people um, who are greedy. So in Robin Hood fashion, she stole from the rich and gave to herself, but also gave to her, her own, you know, the mob. And that, that made her one of the top earners, which made her very important to the, the mob, the main mob figure at that time in, in my story. Well, you mentioned an era a number of times. So what I would like you to do is I would like you to look in the camera and I would like you to thank Montgomery County Community College as Robert De Niro would. This camera? Yeah. Montgomery, you. This place is good. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. John, you're, you're, you're good. You, you are good and you are good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're good. With uh, Johnny Giordano, screenwriter, this is John Ricciuti at Montgomery County Community College, and I hope you found this interview informative and entertaining. And until next time, thank you.